Right, so coming up next, we have John Cleary um, from Seek. Um, John's the principal developer at Seek um, with uh, his current position is leading um, some of the development teams that are building the new generation of Seek APIs. Uh, and John's going to be talking about some of the learnings and lessons um, that he's uh, found along the way of um, enabling that capability for Seek. So hopefully John's available now. Come on up. Thanks, hey, John. Ian. How are you? Yep, doing very good, mate. Thank you very much. Um, so happy to hand over to you now. And um, ladies and gentlemen, John Cleary. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Firstly, hello everyone. Um, thanks to API Days for having me on board today. Um, I hope you're enjoying the conference. I certainly am. And it's great, really great to be here. So I'll just introduce myself first. So my name's John. Most people call me JC or Cleary. Um, I'm a principal software developer. Um, I've been with Seek for about eight years now. Um, for all my fellow Melburnians doing it tough, friends up in Sydney, um, do hope you keep them well. Uh, now we can't be in this strategy stream without talking about the deep connection of business and technology. And so today I'll be talking specifically about Seek um, and a journey we've taken to transition to a brand new API integration platform um, and how the technology choices we've made have, have really accelerated some of our business outcomes. Um, so before I do that, we kind of need a brief history lesson. I think we all know who Seek is. Um, we were founded in 1997, with a competitor to newspapers for job listings. So our you know, what you're well known, what we're well known for is seek.com.au, but we have a, um, several other sites. And we've grown a lot. Um, and as part of that, we've, we've needed to undertake a few mammoth technology transformations over the years. The first, we used to be stuck in the old days of fortnightly release cycles, uh, monolith applications, and have now sort of moved to more of a continuous delivery, um, AWS everything model. Um, and the second technology transformation we're currently embarking on um, you may not know this, but Seek operates around the world. So our second transformation is that um, Seek are currently unifying the technological platforms underpinning our sort of Asia Pacific job boards. Um, these are Jobs DB and Job Street. So they're all separate entities right now with separate technology stacks to boot, uh, which is a big problem. So talking specifically about seek.com.au for a moment, um, here's how we currently look. So in basic user terms, we have Seek hires um, posting jobs, and we have Seek candidates applying for those jobs um, using the Seek website. Um, and Seek hires can actually post directly using the Seek website, or they can post jobs um, via third-party software. So we have a whole bunch of integrators like Job Adder and Broadbean and Itabu um, that post jobs directly to Seek through API integrations. So interestingly enough, those API integrations and the job ads that are posted through that those systems make up a higher percentage of the posted jobs in our Seek website. So it's a pretty pretty big domain. And my team put simply builds and manages everything to do with these API integrations. Specifically about those API integrations, so we have 97 third-party partners, recruitment providers um, that all connect to Seek. Um, we have about 130,000 jobs posted to Seek via APIs per month. Um, quite a lot of traffic and that results in a lot of revenue, 45% of our Seek revenues through our API channel. Um, so that's very significant and 1.2 million um, job applications are sort of received by our APIs per month. So a lot of traffic, a lot of data and a lot of sensitive data as well, which we'll chat about. Moving on to Seek's API integrations landscape. So it's a bit of a visual representation of where we once were and what we're still migrating away from here. Um, you can see the distinction I've tried to make on the right there, um, that we actually have regional APIs servicing those different job boards around Asia Pacific um, overseas. So within those regions or companies, we also have several different APIs with differing authentication methods, inconsistent integration approaches. And these are obviously built by many, many different people and teams over many years. Um, we've existed for 24 years, so it's a, you know, it's a pretty, pretty um, long amount of time to actually build, build some of these services and they've degraded over the years. So as you can probably tell, it's not really um, manageable. There's no real safe way to manage improvements, the APIs across uh, you know, our APAC brands. Um, rolling out new features is really painstaking um, and the APIs are really quite hard to maintain. There's sort of a few legacy code bases and a lot of spaghetti. Um, naturally, this can't scale 
globally. So we need to, to pivot. So today I'm going to introduce you to the Seek API. So this is brand new API integration platform um, from a business perspective. It's been built for two primary reasons. Um, first and foremost, we want to improve our partner integration experience, um, improve our value for Seek Hire's off platform. So really getting into the weeds of the developer experience as well. Um, two, we want to solve an ever-growing problem within Seek that our indirect sort of API channel can't really scale and add value as fast as our, our Seek website can. Um, so it's also historically always been a bit further behind our company's global ambitions in terms of adding value for our hires and partners. Um, so here's a bit of a diagram of how that looks now. So we've, we've moved away from many different APIs servicing different job boards and you know different authentication methods onto more of a seek more of a seek all you can eat buffet um, known as a seek API. Um, so it's built on a core technology stack of GraphQL um, TypeScript as a language, um, all hosted on Amazon Web Services using ECS Fargate. Um, we use Auth0 for authenticating our partners, hires and developers. And there's a there's a swarm of resource APIs, microservices that sit behind our central GraphQL layer um, that backs the core integration that you can see there in the diagram. Um, and we can now continue to expand on that feature set, start to enrich it um, with one sort of integration pattern and authentication method. So what is GraphQL? I mean, many of you might be using this. Um, I've heard a few, a few sprinklings of it throughout the conference as well. It's very popular. Um, GraphQL is a sort of a typed query language in a runtime for most um, popular programming languages. Um, within GraphQL, you define a schema of objects or types, um, as well as queries or mutations, uh, which call essentially many different traditional REST APIs or whatever um, under, under like behind the scenes to resolve that requested data. Um, so in essence, it's kind of like an experience API, if you've ever heard that term. Um, it obscures all of your internal concerns, concepts. It's super powerful as well, which I'll demonstrate. Um, but it looks a, a little bit like this. And so um, you can see the request object up there. Um, we're writing in this GraphQL query language that so we want to query a hero. Um, so the hero is being our object or type that we're, we're trying to fetch. So we're also specifying what we want to know about the hero based on the schema. GraphQL, you can set mutations as well, which is more your, um, your non-read use cases. Um, so creating, updating, deleting. And under the hood, GraphQL is just accepting post requests sent with a bit of a JSON request body that contains the um, stringified query you see at the top there. Um, I'll dig a little bit deeper into GraphQL in a little while, but that's sort of how it basically works. Why GraphQL? Well, we know what GraphQL is, why we choose it over a traditional REST API. For us, it has huge benefits, first and foremost, for our consumers, our partners. Um, and as a side effect, it benefits Seek as well um, to, a great to, to a great deal, um, which I tried to outline here. Um, on the partner side, we've got reduced integration effort, one API, one integration path, pattern, one authentication method less support for Seek, um, which is fantastic. Scheme is standardized against the in industry, so it's consumer centric. Um, it's designed for our consumers and it's industry standard. Um, and on our side, we, because we're obscuring all of our internal concepts, we can evolve the back end without affecting partners as much as we want. Um, it's less chatty for the partner because they're actually making less API calls, um, partly because we've introduced webhooks as, a, um, as more of a sort of a notification mechanism. Um, but also because we're, we're actually um, requesting multiple things in one post request. Um, so the great thing about GraphQL is that you can request multiple objects at the same time. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about that on webhooks as well um, later in the slides. And finally, it's interactive. So GraphQL is a whole heap of things for you, um, the consumer. The for seek means everything becomes self-documented um, and saves us a heap of time. So I'll deep, let's let's delve a little, little bit deeper into that point. So GraphQL um, automatically spins up what's called the playground, and this is a web-based um, UI um, that allows your clients to write queries, fetch data, um, seek offer a GraphQL playground um, with set. It's got separate authentication credentials, sort of isolated from production. Lives on the same server though, um, but it allows our partner developers to play around with the schema, um, which I'll show you here. So. As you can see, I'm querying Seek for location suggestions while I'm posting a job ad um, based off some text that have been put down there in the uh, query variables down the bottom. 
Um, and I can return specific fields within that return location. So I'm just querying contextual name and country code here. You can see that in the response. So we have a really great website that details our entire GraphQL schema, including queries, mutations, inputs, objects. Um, the website automatically builds itself off of our live GraphQL schema. Um, so this lives at developer.seek.com slash schema, if you want to check it out. Um, it's really, really cool. This is a bit proprietary. Um, you know, we've kind of built this um, package ourselves, but we, we think it's really awesome. Suits, suits our partners and our, um, our integrators. So where GraphQL gets really powerful is how it resolves data. So I'm going to query here for the details of a webhook um, HTTP request that was made to one of our partners. So using the power of GraphQL, I can ask for the list of HTTP attempts it made. Under that, reference back to the parent uh, request. And then under that, reference the list of HTTP attempts again, reference the parent again, and query some data in between. So you obviously wouldn't need to go that deep in this specific use case, right? But you can start to see how GraphQL is able to really resolve data on mass and start to really build out a, um, a complex object path um, and schema um, for returning data. So GraphQL is only one part of the CKPI. Um, I'm going to showcase the four pillars in which the, C the CKPI is underpinned by, um, and these encompass a whole bunch of different tooling that we've built. Um, so I'll talk about self-service first. In the old days, we had sort of a number of activities that a partner would need to do in order to get set up to use our APIs from both a development and a go-life perspective. In the modern world, we've really tried to focus on that developer experience and make the whole process self-service. So a lot, that a lot that needs to happen here. Um, to start, well, I mean, the most important thing is documentation, right? Um, you know, even if you're not planning on integrating with Seek, I really encourage you to look at our dev site. We've put a huge amount of effort into this. Um, uh, it's neat, star-eyed, and all, all the examples that we actually have, so the code examples we have, um, are automatically smoke tested. So every time we make a deployment, we're actually making sure that the developer site's code samples are, you know, tested against our playground environment, which I think is really cool. Um, and it, it sort of maintains that developer site accuracy. The second thing we've done is we've built what's called the developer dashboard. Um, so here, Seek Partner developers can access a portal to manage the webhook subscriptions, view events, replay events, view statistics, um, set up notifications, um, manage hire relationships. Um, we'll be adding the ability to manage API credentials and we'll also sort of embed audit logs. So you can check when you've got validation errors to our API. Um, for debugging, all sorts of things like that. We got a bit bored one day and decided to make an internal to seek fake third-party recruitment platform, um, lovingly, called, lovingly called Ryanair. It can post jobs to seek, um, receive applications via the Seek API, amongst a variety of other features. Um, it's designed to demo to our partners who are onboarding. It's also used to test our integrations in the live environment. Um, we, we love it. It's fun to build. Um, it's built using React, its own little GraphQL server and a DynamoDB database. Um, integrated with Braid, which is our global um, Seek design system as well. After Ryanair was built, we wanted to open source everything we possibly could. So um, we decided to build a reference implementation called Wingman um, with front end and back end code that de partner developers can use to integrate with Seek API out of Ryanair components. Um, we're still evolving as we go. It's not perfect, but you can check it out at um, github.com slash seek dash OSS slash wingman encourage you to do so. Second pillar, observable. One of the biggest challenges, as you all know, as API developers is knowing who is using what uh, within your API. So you can effectively manage breaking changes, roll out new features, decommission endpoints. This helps us stay close to the customer as well, of course. API developers, I think you can very easily build for yourself and not for others. Um, so remember the GraphQL schema page I showed you a few slides ago? Well, we have an internal version of that um, that allows us to drill into our entire GraphQL schema and look at which of our third-party partners use them, um, you know, queries, mutations, whatever it is, all the way down to the field level. So before we deploy changes to our GraphQL schema, um, you know, we, we actually have automated scripts that programmatically check this for us to ensure we don't push out any breaking changes, which is really cool. Um, we built our own proprietary system here. GraphQL providers like Apollo and things offer these kinds of solutions out of the box, but um, cost money, of course. 
Secondly, we've integrated with Atlassian stats page to automatically provide partners with real-time information on incidents, other critical messaging. Um, it's really, really useful for getting, getting the word out. We've hooked this up to our internal monitoring platform, so everything's automated here. Um, we always do have a person that's in between. So we have automated systems that are monitoring our stack, but um, before an incident goes up on this web website, um, we always have a dev just to tick, say, yes, we want it to go to the website. It's extremely helpful, but we obviously want to you know, make sure that messaging is accurate. On the internal front, we built this amazing tool called Back Office, um, allows our API support team to access information about all of our objects within the Seek API jobs, hirers, partners. Um, you can onboard new partners, manage hire and partner relationships the same way the developer dashboard can. Having this kind of visibility is fantastic for developers as well because we can support the product we're building. Um, sifting through all the logs is not the best way to diagnose a production issue sometimes. It could just be down to configuration. Third pillar, scalable. So we want to go global. To do that, we need to build an API that's ready to function for completely different markets, brands, feature sets, um, multiple job boards, and users from all walks of life. So quite a lot to think about there. The first thing we tried to do with um, our objects within the Seek API was, um, was we wanted to invent a, a different way of identifying them. So Seek API is built for a global audience. Um, the IDs that we use to identify these objects need to be globally unique. Um, UWIDs are great for this purpose if you have kind of a single database behind the hood. Um, as mentioned, we have kind of several job boards, different data sources, it just wouldn't scale. So to solve this, we invented the object identifier pattern. Um, partner looks just a bit like a human readable ID, but it's just an opaque string, um, should be stored that way. I won't go into the different parts here, but you can see how we can sort of scale this model to any job board in any country. Webhooks, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, so um, our old API used to just have polling mechanisms where you continuously call a REST API for applications and other things. For Seek API, we use the industry standard of webhooks, scalable, reliable, these days really secure. Um, we emit several different events out to our partners, like when a job goes live, expired, or when a candidate application comes through for a job. Webhooks can be set up uh, via the developer dashboard I mentioned earlier. And for security, the partner can create a webhook subscription with just a secret. We use that secret to sign any requests. Um, and obviously on the other side, they decode that secret. Migrating your API partners to a whole new API is really hard. Um, our delivery team started by migrating a couple of our existing partners to the Seek API while we we're sort of in the alpha beta phase. Um, what became quite clear is that partners need a lot of handholding in this respect. Um, with nearly 100 partners to migrate within a year, we needed a separate team to manage the rollout. So we spun up a brand new team called the Implementation Squad. Um, squad's heavily focus, uh, heavily business focus. Its primary job is to contact our existing API partners, form them with the new API, get them to decide on a migration timeline, kick off with them, and then handhold throughout that process. So we rotate, as you can see in the diagram, two of our developers through that um, team every fortnight. Um, so this is purely to give the implementation squad some technical support. Um, eventually, hopefully, we don't need to do that anymore. Fourth pillar, consistent. So a big problem with building APIs is the developers move on, Developers, new developers take the reins. How do you ensure you can maintain the API long-term? An important part of being consistent is being consistent with the delivery, of course. We opt for many small deployments a day rather than one big feature release every few weeks. And this is, of course, really vital to reduce your incidents because you can track incidents back to smaller changes, which is much easier to roll back. Um, it's great for developers because the de delivery of everything you're building is sped up. Um, continuous delivery is sort of fairly common practice these days. Um, and to do this, we use BuildKite as our CI tool. Um, team do between 30 to 40 deployments a day, a variety of services, um, ranging from yeah, small version upgrades on third-party third dependencies to sort of full-blown features. Um, quite a lot, quite a lot of changes that, are, that we're making over time. Of course, this needs governance. We have strict automated processes that help prevent issues in production. So we have a standard set of unit testing and linting across code bases we're changing. On top of that, we run integration tests um, against local snapshots of our databases, uh, mocked API dependencies that we have using Docker. Um, we use GraphQL Inspector to detect if there's any schema changes that will affect live partners before we go, go out the door. We've got an automated smoke testing system that runs a whole suite of high level tests against any new deployment. Um, there's a tester we've built called the Fuzzer, um, 
which generates random request data, puts load on the API, see if anything unexpected happens. So this is good for when you're testing a fairly risky change and you want to get some, get some coverage. And that usually is a long running test, so you don't need to do it every time. Um, and finally, um, any new changes, as I mentioned, are automatically validated against the examples on the developer side. So if you break something on the developer side, you obviously need to fix the developer side or, or change it within your code. Here's just some examples of some of those um, test suite failures that I mentioned. Um, so we've got breaking change detection at the top, removed a, removed a um, particular field from an object that was being used, smoke test failure, so some stuff around our events, um, and then fuzz failure, so we've got a random questionnaire creation, took uh, quite a long time for a request, so we're able to diagnose any performance issues from that load. What's the most important thing for good API documentation, of course? Um, so on the internal side, we have a whole suite of internal documentation, um, ranging from API design guidelines, uh, support documentation for all of the services we own, um, how to's, um, answers to common partner questions are really useful as we rotate through the implementation squad. Um, our internal readmes are really descriptive, um, diagrams, information as well, which is really, really important. And if a new developer joins, they should have really everything they need to get started and to continue on. Um, Try to, to cover as many things as we can. The final aspect under the consistent pillar um, is our adherence to HR open standards. So HR open standards provide sort of industry standard guidance for structuring data in the human resources sector. Um, it's informed by professionals and organizations um, within the sector. And so six GraphQL schema is pretty closely aligned to um, HR open standards um, for its own schema and automated validation ensures it sort of stays consistent. We also have a lot of like proprietary things that we have within Seek that's specific to Seek, but um, we try to keep a, you know, a pretty open mind to the industry. We've set ourselves a pretty ambitious goal. We're gonna decommission our old APIs, have everyone using the Seek API by the end of June next year. We only started. Uh, a couple of months ago. So far we're on track um, somehow, uh, but it is a, a painstaking process, but it's also very, very interesting and a lot of learnings. Um, so of course I can't really sit here and take credit for a lot of this work that we've done. This was all done by an amazing team over at Seek. Um, continue to amaze me in their innovation. Pleasure to work with them every day. Um, a lot of incredible tooling has come out of our, our team. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. So it's so a lot to cover in such a short time, but thank you for tuning in and having a listen. Um, hope you're able to learn a thing or two. Um, keep with me on all the usual channels. You want to chat? Love to hear from you. But I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, John. Um, I guess question, I'll, I'll kick off. If you had your time again, what would you have done differently with the lessons that you've learned with the benefit of hindsight? That's a really, really great question. <laughs> it's it's not often that you get a chance to reflect on that, is it? I think um, you can quite quite easily get in the, the weeds of delivery and not reflect back. Um, mm -hmm. I think doing this presentation gave me an opportunity to look at some of the amazing tooling we've built and, and reflect on that a little bit. But in terms of actually, um, you know, looking back again and starting fresh, um, I think it's it's really all about talking to your API consumers. I think it's 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 very very important to get their input straight away, um, you know, before you build any API. Um, so I think I think we we you know you obviously try to do that as best you can. I think as developers, it's very different to do to 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 be able to do that. Um, yeah. You obviously have product managers and all sorts of different people within that process that have a stake in it. So. Um, but I think as developers, we really need to do that. We really need to actually get in, involved in that conversation um, with partners. And I think what I've really found with the implementation squad, as I mentioned within the presentation, is we're actually getting a chance to get really close to the developers that are integrating with our API. So we're, we're chatting with them on a daily basis. We're using Slack to communicate with them. We're, we're getting as close as we possibly can to being able to respond to, to them. So um, that would be my advice for anyone building an API. Just just um, have a Zoom with them and chat. <laughs> Talk about their struggles. Totally. So ultimately, I think get, getting an understanding of that with the business and, and IT working together, um, it, it, is there more in terms of 
having the, the the communication going more regularly in terms of the, the, the cadence is that kind of part of the message that you you'd give there yeah well we have um we have sort of weekly check-in meetings with all of our integrators um just to obviously get get up to speed obviously during the migration process as they go to the new api um, and we always have developers on that call um so it's yeah. never usually a, a you know a business conversation it's it's um it's sort of a mixture of a technical and a business conversation about the challenges they're facing from from um, a business standpoint as well as integration challenges and things that developers can specifically respond to yeah. um yeah i think that's a it's really really important to do that it, get, it builds confidence for the developers too because you're starting to you know you're starting to actually work with people that that um that are going to be using the stuff you're coding yeah uh so question from the floor is how hard is it to sunset old api suites and push the adoption of a new suite um, yeah <laughs> a very involved process um it starts mainly with um as i mentioned the implementation squad they actually reach out and start to determine timelines and things like that yeah. um but we, we um we end up going through a fairly long process with our biggest one of our biggest biggest partners that that onboarded with us recently um it took I think three or four months of um, just continuous back and forth and trying to trying to resolve issues and test and and um, and get through that process. Um, and so a lot of developer involvement in that one. That was actually when we were in beta phase or alpha phase. Yeah. Um, so it was obviously a lot more um, involved because we were learning yeah. things about our API that that um, that we sort of hadn't seen before. So um, a lot of really good feedback and sort of reflection there. Um, but yeah, it takes a very long time. I think over the next 12 months, as we migrate 97 partners, it's going to take about 10 to 12 partners on boarding at once. Um, so you need a lot of support overhead from Seek um, yes. to do that. Um, but they, they all generally take a few months um, to get through. Uh, it's quite a quite a long time. Yeah, the hardest part is getting the external consumers to successfully migrate over to the new versions because they're impacted. Uh, and they have to bear the cost of rebuilding to talk to your new API suite. Yep. Uh, yeah. And we have, we also have two different consumers as well. We've got hirers, the seek hirers that are posting jobs, and we've got the partners that are integrating with the API. So we need to consider both in that yep. scenario, um, which is very difficult to, ba to balance the two. Um, and quite often, a partner might not want to integrate with um, a part of your API, but a hirer does. A hirer really wants that value prop. But, the partner sees, sees no value in their in their um, yeah. connection to that that service. So it's interesting. I think there's a lot of different challenges that, that apply with our space. Mm -hmm. Got another question from the floor. Uh, what are the steps you'll take to ensure APIs are decommissioned by June? I can't remember what which are the steps. Doing for you, but yeah, yeah. It's a similar um, similar question to the to the last one. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what we've tried to do with the CKPI is build it pretty much entirely independently. It doesn't actually have any connection to the legacy um, bar a few different sort of object references like IDs and things. Um, so we try to build it really independently. That What that means is that the moment that we actually have the last partner roll, uh, roll off at the end of June next year um, is that we can literally just switch off everything. Um, and so decommissioning becomes more about just getting partners off it rather than actually having you know the, the technical debt in, in woven through your application so the ckpi is um is yeah it's really really nicely built in that sense that it's um it's sort of a more of a greenfields um mm -hmm. approach to to um how we how we sort of um, migrate um yeah but we have a lot of challenges in this space anyway because we have um, as we as we're migrating from you know our seek hires they've obviously got jobs that have been posted using the old legacy apis um yes. as they sort of transition to the new and so there's a few challenges in how we you know migrate data and that's usually on 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 seek to figure out but there's a lot of things that, that partners obviously need to do in that space as well yeah because that will have a long running systems. life cycle where you might have the initial uh one on the old api but it, it the, the life cycle of that job hire is, is yep. bleeding over into the new world yeah 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 um, and so there's so many different ways that partner systems work like the, the, all these recruitment systems have vastly different needs and requirements um, so quite often it's a very nuanced discussion and how that that migration happens we do try and document everything we possibly can too like the developer side i mentioned has a full migration guide from phase one to phase five of um, authentication all the way through to managing your job ads on seek and so we do try to 
to, to document as many of those nuances as we possibly can. Um, I think that's really important as well. Respond to partner feedback there too. Yeah. A similar question. Do you see a use case for having the flexibility of both REST and GraphQL? Um, and then again, making the point that um, how do you convey the business value of migrating across uh, to somebody who's already on um, an API, but it's just old technology and they're still getting the same business um, value? Um, yeah. Yep. So Sounds like there's, there's a couple of questions there. So I think the first the first part of this is sort of the, the difference between REST and Graph, and I think is, is a very important question that we tried to answer as well. Um, what's, what's really important is that obviously behind our Graph, we have a whole ton of REST APIs underneath that. So we actually still obviously use REST for everything, um, for, for all of our sort of resources, our resource APIs. They're all quite microservices. Um, so, but we use Graph as our as a sort of integration layer, and I suppose there's two different problems there. It's like if you're actually using REST and Graph as your integration pattern for a partner, um, it is it is obviously a bit jarring. Um, so, I think it's important to to be very clear about which one you choose because I think the, the way partner developers integrate is going to be affected by that. Um, and the second part, I think, um, was sort of around the business proposition of moving to GraphQL. Um, so I think I've tried to demonstrate a little bit of that in the in the presentation, but I think the um the, the biggest the biggest benefit is is for the consumer because it's just that that one all you can eat buffet of everything that I need from Seek I can just request at yeah. once as well. Um, so it's really really good for the consumer. Obviously that's that's more of a cons consumer first mindset for Seek. Um, I think it just gives us a a platform to um to to manage scale. At a, at a global level. So we can actually just have, um, you know, we've also got different job boards, they've got different features, they've got different users, they've got different localization problems um, to boot. So having a sort of a, a graph server that you're able to encompass, um, um, you, you know, the feature sets of all your different job boards is, is one of the, the things that I think um, we chose the GraphQL for because it gives us a bit more flexibility. Um, I think with REST, it, it sort of ties you to, to naming things in a specific way, I think um, you know, in terms of the 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 um, the the outcomes you're trying to achieve with a REST API, um, are obviously the same as a GraphQL. But I think there's a number of problems when it comes to decommissioning things and trying to get observability on the endpoints that are being consumed by your partners. Um, it just gets a very very challenging, and it's usually done manually as well. Like you, in order to create that observability in a REST API, it's usually a very manual process to understand who's using what. Um, the GraphQL just have, has all this stuff out of the box, which I think is really useful, um, for especially for Seek and definitely totally, for I totally agree. No, that's fantastic. And I think that's kind of all the time we have. Um, so I just want to thank you once again, uh, John.